you guys had fun. I was like, yeah, where are you going with this? And she said, didn't you have a friend who was a county police officer who was a good role model to you, helped give you? I said, yeah, I didn't remember that. She goes, you've spent your whole life taking and nothing giving back. It's time. It was a long four years. <laughs> um, and then I ended up running for county executive, so it turned into 10 years. Um, that first four years, I represented half a million people with one staff person and another full-time job as lawyer for a multi-billion dollar multinational that thought my being elected was a hobby that they didn't particularly support. Um, and uh, we had three kids in three years. So it was a busy first couple years. Um, serving in the Senate now for nine years has been a different experience because uh, in county government you get to tick people off every day and it's someone who is your neighbor who you actually know. You're fighting over you know sewers and zoning and setbacks and police response time and libraries and things that um, help build a community but also things that people tend to fight about a lot uh, because they're very close to home. Um, I'm now fighting over stuff like, you know, should we go to war with Iran? What do we do with North Korea? Things have very minimal consequence. And what should we be doing at the border? And whether we should have a government shutdown over funding and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm on five committees. I'm on foreign relations, judiciary, appropriations, small business and entrepreneurship, and ethics. I'm the vice chair of ethics. The ethics committee is the only genuinely bipartisan committee in the Senate. Means there's equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats, and we cannot act without four votes. So you, nothing happens unless there's bipartisan agreement. And the entire time I've served on it, Johnny Isaacson is my best friend in the Senate. He's a Republican from Georgia. Every decision we've made has been unanimous. That takes a special kind of person, um, and he and I have really enjoyed building a relationship. It's a relationship that started. Uh, because when I got there nine years ago, I had the chance to chair the Africa subcommittee. Uh, as a junior in college, I went to Kenya uh, for a semester, and it really changed my life. It challenged my worldview and sort of reframed how I saw the world. Um, Johnny was my ranking member those first four years. I'd never heard of him. I had no idea who this guy was. A conservative from the South who represented the same district as Newt Gingrich and shares literally none of my views on social policies at all. Um, but as we traveled together and worked together, I came to realize that this guy was actually a gracious, thoughtful, reasonable person uh, with whom I still disagree on about 80 percent, but who I've been able to work um, to resolve some things that really help change people's lives. So um, I am at times despondent about the conditions of our national politics and gravely concerned about um, what it meant in 2016. Tens of millions of middle Americans basically said, I can't stand any of you all and went in and you know, punched for Trump. Um, I don't know what they thought they were getting, but if this is what they thought they were getting and they're really happy about it and they want to reelect him, I'm even more surprised. Um, but for folks of my, I'm a Democrat if I didn't say that. For folks <laughs> of my party, uh, it was meant as a wake-up call. Uh, part of the point of democracy is that when people are really unhappy with what you're doing, they tell you, um, sometimes in direct ways, sometimes in indirect ways. This was both. Um, now the question is, what are we supposed to do about it? I spent a lot of time building real friendships with folks across the aisle because that's what I hear from Delawareans. It's why can't you all get along and why can't you solve problems? I don't know what state my colleagues are going home to. Like who's going home to a state where people are meeting them at the airport and saying, more dysfunction, more shutdowns. Like I, I don't get that. Um, but all I'm really aware of and responsible for is my state. So I've done six town halls in the last six months and from Georgetown to Claymont, I hear a pretty similar theme. Um, so let's do a town hall. Uh, ask me some tough questions. Suggest some answers. Tell me what you're seeing that are unmet needs. I will do my best to speak to education related issues, but I will remind you I neither serve on an education related committee nor are most of the challenges you face in education federal responsibilities. But we have an absolutely critical role in terms of setting sort of tone and agenda. You know, investments in things like Title I uh, or school lunch programs play a key role. The federal role in education I view as catalytic, not feedstock, sorry, it's a chemist term, as um, you know, sort of driving change in, in the biggest way but not sustaining and fueling it. That's really got to be supported at the state and local level or it's not sustainable. So um, I'll end where I started. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. It is a really hard job. I know that. Uh, we are not giving you the resources, the autonomy, the authority that you need to do the job well and we ask teachers to deal with kids as they are, which means they are walking in the door carrying every dysfunction in our society and every challenge in their families. 
and yet we ask you to be the person who solves or at least addresses most of that. Um, in my lifetime, I think we have made steady progress in education in Delaware, um, but I'd be interested in what you think. Um, I did not realize um, how relatively strong our Votech system was until I started doing education uh, work with my colleagues. And what I hear from them about Votech in their states is dramatically different from what I've experienced here, um, in that we have a, a healthy, strong, competent, articulated relationship between Votech schools, employers, a community college system, and colleges and universities that generally is relatively functional. Many states, at least according to their senators, Votech is all but dead or dysfunctional. Um, and the connection between community college, the state university, and the high school system is, is badly broken. So um, I felt I was probably more critical of that whole system when I was in county government. The more time I spend federally, I'm like, we actually get things pretty right here. Um, there is lots to improve, but compared to everywhere else, yay, Delaware. <laughs> so thanks for a chance to be with you. You've got the first question I can tell. And, uh, and Brandon, if you, if you guys could just, when you introduce yourself, tell me where you yes, teach. It's uh, good to see you, and I hope Sarah's doing well. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, ex you know, what exciting things are going on in education, either bills you're working on or bills that, that are in the committees that can help teachers and their students? Exciting. Um, so um, actually, a, a bill that I've been working, this is the second Congress now, is called Teachers Are Leaders. And to give just a quick course summary of it, uh, it's based on a model out of Iowa. Joni Ernst, who's a Republican senator from Iowa, is my lead co-sponsor. We have a dozen bipartisan co-sponsors. It, it essentially says you shouldn't have to become an administrator if you are a very capable, talented teacher and you're looking for advancement opportunities. They, they should be available not leaving the classroom and not leaving an instructional role. And in an awful lot of school systems, the only way you get an increase in seniority and pay in responsibility is by becoming an administrator. Um, and so this tries to fund demonstration programs for school systems nationally that recognize uh, teachers who are leaders and rewards them and uh, encourages and supports them in roles that are not administratable. What's it called again? Sorry. Teachers are leaders. Teachers. Kelsey McGill, who's sitting right behind you, is nodding furiously and is delighted to know that I actually know about this bill. Because <laughs> most senators can't tell you what their bills actually are. Um, the bill I've dedicated the most time to, because th that one's a pretty easy sell. I mean, I, you know, that's a, that's a three minute explanation and most senators are like, yeah, sounds good to me. Um, Johnny Isaacson was my co-sponsor in the last two Congresses. He has abandoned me. Um, in this Congress, so it's been reintroduced with Democrats only, but we're working on him. Um, something called the Aspire Act that is designed to drive accountability for colleges and universities about access and completion. It's somewhat complex. Simply put, you have one list of the best endowed universities and one list. You have a list of all the universities and colleges in America. What percentage of your student body are Pell recipients? The lowest, if you use Pell Grant uh, eligibility as, as a marker for um, economic diversity, the schools with the lowest percentage of Pell Grant students are the most competitive and best endowed schools. So your Ivy League, your um, schools that have you know, multi-billion dollar endowments and admit 8% of their students tend to have 5, 6, 7, 8% of their student body as Pell your schools that have virtually no endowment and that are large state universities or HBCUs tend to be 60, 70, 80 percent Pell Grant. Okay? So you make a list and the ones that are at the bottom, you come up with a process where you say you get a couple, we're putting you on notice, Princeton, we're putting you on notice, Stanford, and if you don't make any progress in access over several years, you start paying a fee into a penalty pool. That penalty pool now gets distributed to a different list which is by completion. So what percentage of your students graduate in six years? The ones who are at the bottom here or at the top here? The ones that are at the top here or at the bottom here? So the schools that, the schools that take the highest percentage of first-generation low-income students have the lowest percentage of completion. <coughs> not exactly, not one-to-one. -one. 
And what we're trying to do is to apply the lessons that schools like Georgia State and Arizona State have applied that are relatively inexpensive but require people connecting with students who are new to the experience of college. You take this money, you give it to them. It's much more complicated, but that's basically what it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, my name is Tasha. I teach at Georgia Middle School in Atlanta. Um, my question, uh, we learned, we talked a little bit um, earlier today with Fran about lessons um, in civility. So what lessons have you learned in civility? I'd, I'd welcome some advice. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was looking for your advice. Like, how yeah. can we um, teach our kids to be more civil yeah. based on what you've learned? You know, um, I was about to say something about our president, and I really will restrain myself. That's first thing is restraint. Um, my mother used to say, God gave you two ears and one mouth. That should suggest a ratio. If you listen more than you talk, that's a good start. Um, the, the bedrock of civility is respect, and the bedrock of respect is understanding. So if we do not understand each other, if we have no idea where the person we are having some Twitter fight or um, public disagreement with, if we don't understand where they're coming from, then we are more likely to disrespect them because it's based on a sense of difference uh, and a lack of understanding. Um, first, second, you need to have some incentives, some reward system that rewards civility. Um, and one of our bigger challenges, I think, in civil discourse in our country is an increasing abandonment of the idea that compromise is constructive. I do a lot of listening to and talking with my colleagues about um, our system assumes that the best way to resolve conflict is not force of arms, is not shooting each other or having another civil war, um, but um, sending representatives to Washington who come from very different states with different values and different priorities to hash it out. But that only works if we actually compromise. So to me, civility is relatively simple. You have to believe that there is some value system that reinforces, rewards, benefits from listening to each other rather than simply trying to drown each other out and hit each other. And you have to root that in a willingness to say, I may not be right about absolutely everything. And the first of those is, I may not be right about your experience, your attitude, your worldview, so let me listen. You've got to be humble, you've got to listen, you've got to be willing to prioritize compromise, and you've got to be willing to risk upsetting your team, party, tribe, caucus, whatever it is. Um, those run counter to a lot of instincts in modern American life, which you know, tries to amp up our sense of identity, our sense of difference, and our sense of conflict. So I'm a Penn State fan, you're a Michigan fan, yay, we hate each other. What? Um, you know, fill in the blank. I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican, I'm a Northerner, you're a Southerner. We have a lot of ways to um, strengthen difference um, rooted in identity and misunderstanding. We do not have enough ways to strengthen mutual understanding rooted in a common sense of a commitment to a national mission. Did I say anything that spoke to your question at all? Okay. <laughs> One of the things I have said uh, more than once in other countries, so Johnny Isaacson's from Atlanta. It's in Georgia. My family's from the north. My great-great-grandfather was one of Sherman's colonels. Anybody following where I'm going? Um, we've traveled to Nigeria together three times. Some of the Nigerian legislators we've talked to say, oh, you know, our fragile young democracy, we had this horrible civil war, the Biafra War, just about 50 years ago, and there's still a lot of lingering resentment and tension as a result of it. I'm like, 